Well, good evening. Good evening. And welcome to our worship service here at First Presbyterian Church in Coppers Cove. Ooh, sorry, that was my fault. Um, we are glad that you are here this evening as we are beginning our season of Lent with our Ash Wednesday service. We are um, going to be um, doing a number of things during this worship service, and um, we, but, but the most important thing is that we want to remember what the season is about. During this season, we celebrate our redemption through the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lent is a time to prepare, just as Advent is a time to prepare. And so this evening, we begin by first acknowledging our need for repentance and for the mercy and forgiveness of our Lord. One thing we will do this evening is we will provide for you a time of offering those things which stand as obstacles to your walk with Jesus over to him, to give those obstacles over to him. And I invite you to begin now to consider those confessions which you are moved by the Spirit to offer. And then to use these orange slips of paper, which are on the pew backs in front of you, and, and to, during the service, when you are moved by the Spirit, write a confession or two, a sin which you wish to be rid of, in order that you may be in a better relationship with our Savior. When we are dismissed this evening, we will gather outside to then burn these. The imagery is incredibly powerful, and I pray that the act will be helpful in strengthening your resolve to repent of these things. So as you leave the service tonight, I would invite you to take your slips of paper and fold them several times. And then um, our elder Grace Hoy, over, our elder over worship, will be in the narthex with a basket. And you may place them in the basket. And then as we go outside, we can gather um, a safe distance around the fire. And I will then put those into the fire and we can quietly observe. Also tonight, we will have the imposition of ashes. Ashes on the forehead in the shape of a cross are a sign of our creatureliness, a reminder of our frailty and our mortality. The ashes themselves symbolize the dust and the broken debris of our lives, as well as the reality that eventually each of us will die. We follow Jesus into the wilderness and then to the cross to learn from him that new life is through death. We learn we need to change directions from self-serving towards self-giving. And then finally, we will come as well to the table to celebrate the Lord's Supper for nourishment and for strengthening from partaking in the bread and the cup, the body and the blood of our Savior. So I invite you now, in the name of Christ, to begin to observe a holy Lent, marked by self-examination and penitence, by prayer and fasting, by works of love, and by reading and meditating on the Word of God. Let us now listen to the call to worship. Please listen for the call to worship. 
God sent Christ into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God's God's love love endures endures forever. forever. God is our refuge and strength, a present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. God's God's love love endures forever. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. Gracious Gracious God, you you despise despise nothing you you have made, made, and you forgive the sins of all who trust in you. Create in us new and contrite hearts that truly repenting of our sins and acknowledging our brokenness we may receive from you the God of mercy, full pardon and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now please stand if you are able and let us sing the hymn, O God, Show Mercy to Us. Let us pray. Merciful God, your word is our way of truth and life. Create in us hearts that are clean and put your Holy Spirit within us so that we may receive your grace and declare your praise forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Gospel reading is from Luke 15, verses 11 through 24. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. 
He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was, was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on the finger, on his finger, and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may remain seated, but let us sing hymn number 421, Have Mercy God Upon My Life. The Old Testament reading today comes from Psalms. We'll be reading Psalms 51, verses 1 through 4 and 10 through 17. Listen now for God's word to you. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Wondrous Savior, uphold me now as we uplift you. Amen. Well, the psalm that we just sang, Psalm 51, and then the psalm that I just read, Psalm 51, is truly a classic prayer one that captures the faithful person in the act of throwing themselves open to God's mercy. Although there is certainly debate, this psalm has long been thought to pertain to the terrible incident in which David seduced Bathsheba, the wife of loyal Uriah, and then arranged for Uriah's murder in battle. The language about sin is so universal, however, that the psalm has spoken over the ages for the widest variety of human sin. Martin Luther said that here the doctrine of true repentance is set before us. The psalmist, whether David or not, is convinced of the personal and the profound manner in which God has been offended. And he is concerned that the relationship which God intended to be warmly intimate has been shattered. He offers the sacrifice of humility, the broken spirit and a contrite heart as an atonement. And he makes a beautiful appeal to God's steadfast love and abundant grace. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. One weekend many, many years ago, during a ride home from a presbytery meeting, I opened up a conversation with two Bible scholars that were sharing my ride regarding Ash Wednesday texts. One of them this. It was not long before I was somewhat regretting this, since the conversation quickly got away from me and went over my head. But I did pick up on something in their conversation, something that got me thinking and still gets me thinking when I read it. I invite you to, to consider the psalmist's petitions. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. 
whether the psalmist really thought that God would cast him from God's presence or take God's Holy Spirit from him or not, we have no way of knowing. But it is obvious that he certainly thought about it. He thought about what being cast from God's presence might really be like, and he didn't like it, not one little bit. Can you imagine it? Can you think of what life might be like without God? Can you let your mind go there at all? Certainly it would be terrifying. Certainly it would be lonely, isolating, barren, deeply sad, filthy, dark, joyless, purposeless. We'd be helpless and vulnerable and doomed and without a doubt hopeless. It would be well a hell. In fact, the inferno by Dante, the gate of hell, is imagined this way. I am the way into the city of woe. I am the way to eternal sorrow. Abandon all ye hope who enter here. Friends, while I've presented this as an imagination exercise, this is actually what we do to ourselves when we sin. We go down the path of taking ourselves out of God's presence. Since God's nature is pure and holy and completely righteous, God is naturally set against sin. And when we sin, we push ourselves spiritually away from God. We do it to ourselves. God doesn't do it. Reverend John Hanna says this, no one who ever, no one who is ever in hell, wherever that is, may say to God, you put me here. Just as no one who is in heaven will ever be able to say, I put myself here. And horribly, when our souls abide in this estranged place long enough, our consciousness, consciences can become progressively numbed to the point that it is no longer foreign feeling. But, but, the wonderful news is this. God does not ever leave us. There is no place that we can be that is outside of God's forgiving, salvific reach. There's no place deep enough or far enough or hellish enough that God cannot reach us. In fact, Scripture says that God, like the father of the prodigal son, is always waiting with arms extended No, actually, it's this. Scripture actually says that God is always running to us. Always running. And before we can even utter the words that are on our hearts, the word of repentance that we feel, we need only reach out to receive God's holy embrace. That's the kind of God that we have. Theologian and professor, my professor, Cindy Rigby, describes this so vividly. She tells a story about a picture given her brother for Christmas. It was a picture taken of her brother's seven-year-old son, Cindy's nephew, Oscar, running down the sidewalk toward him. Oscar, she describes, is running down the sidewalk with an expression of the purest joy on his face. In the foreground of the picture, you see Cindy's brother's hand extended and open. 
He is facing Oscar, waiting to receive him. It's a great picture, Cindy says. And he, she goes on. And, and this is the God of our imagination, the God who waits patiently for us to run to him, ever ready to receive, ever ready to bless. But this God is too foggy. This God is too distant. This God is too predictable, too respectable. Instead, our God, the God we know in Jesus Christ, cannot wait to receive us, and so comes running towards us. This God is the one who is always and forever running down the sidewalk, even now, a look of joy and expectation on his face, eager to be embraced, even when we pull our hands back, even when we refuse to go to the party, even when we deny and remove ourselves, even when we crucify. So, brothers and sisters, the season of Lent, the 40 days prior to Easter, is a time of self-examination. It's a time of meditation and spiritual discipline, a time of study and prayer. Lent comes from the English word Lenten, meaning spring. Not only a reference to the season of the year, but also an invitation to a springtime for the soul. A time to remember. A time to remember our sinfulness, our mortality, and our dependence on the presence of our Creator in our lives a time to remember that we are dust. In ancient Israel, the symbolism of ashes was a forceful reminder of the pervasiveness of human sin and of the inevitability of human death, since ashes, or dust, represent that which was burned out and wasted We are forever trying to cast ourselves out of the intimate relationship that God so desires with us. We do it over and over and over again, and for this we must repent. But Lent is also a time to remember that just as we are dust, God is in love with dust and from the very beginning has done and does amazing things with dust. While we humans have always resisted the relationship that God has tenaciously offered us in creation and in the people of Israel, God has finally united with us in Jesus Christ so completely that we have the opportunity to attain a perfect relationship with God through him. As Catherine Tanner says, in Christ, humanity has has fully become God's own. And during Lent, we can remember that on the cross, Jesus felt abandoned, cast outside of the Father's holy presence as he took humanity's sins upon himself. But with his resurrection, these evils, even death, no longer carry any power. And we, still in perfect solidarity with Christ, come come perfectly and forever into God's presence if we only believe. We have dust with new life. Yes, during these next weeks of Lent, we need remember these things that we are dust, that on our own, over and over again, we cast ourselves out of the presence of God, and this is grievous, but that we are also dust given new life, offered us by the one whose keenest desire is to see us let go of our sins and to be held in his forgiving embrace, to dwell in the joy of his presence now, and for eternity. This Lenten season, let us read this scripture with different pronouns. 
Create in us clean hearts. O God, and renew steadfast spirits within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Amen. Before we uh, join in the penance, um, I will do the italic size part and y'all will do the bold part. Holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, our mind, and our strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not forgotten others as we have been forgiven. We have not listened to your call to serve as Christ served us, we have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. We confess to you, O oh God, all of our past and unfaithfulness, the pride, the hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. Our self-indulgent appetite and ways in our exploitation of other people. Our anger at our own frustration and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. Our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work.
in worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us. We confess to you, O God. Accept our repentance, O God, for the wrongs we have done, for our neglect of human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Accept our repentance, O God. For all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and for our prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us. Accept Accept our our repentance, O God. For our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Accept Accept our our repentance, O God. Restore us, O God, and let your anger depart from us. Favorably hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Let us remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of our Savior, bring us with all your saints to the joy of Christ's resurrection. Amen. Again, you may be, remain seated, but let us sing hymn number 442, Just As I Am Without One Plea. Friends, I invite you this evening to come to the table. Come to it not because you must, but because you may. Come to it not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come because not because of any goodness of your own that gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come here to meet the risen Lord, for it is his table, and he invites everyone, everyone who trusts and believes in him 
to come share in this joyful feast that he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. You are our God and we are the creatures of your hand. You made us from the dust of the earth. You breathed into us the breath of life and you set us in your world to love and serve you. When we rejected your love and ignored your wisdom, you did not reject us. You loved us still, and you called us to turn again to you in obedience and in love. Out of your great love for the world, you sent Jesus among us to set us free from the tyranny of evil. He lived as one of us, sharing our joys and sorrows, and by his dying and rising, he releases us from bondage to sin and frees us from the dominion of death. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts that you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen, our joys and our sorrows. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who trust in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. Indeed, unite us with those around the world who are undergoing suffering right now, O oh Lord. Our hearts are breaking for what is, we know, breaking yours. May the tragic nightmare of war of humankind's inhumanity to humankind be ended everywhere that there is conflict. We know that it is true that for Jesus there are no countries to be conquered no ideologies to be imposed, no people to be dominated, only children, women, and men to be loved. Be with all the victims of war now, dear Lord. And Lord, keep our eyes fixed on you until this mortal life is ended and all that is earthly returns to dust. Let us serve you faithfully until with the redeemed of all the ages we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Let us now pray the prayer our Savior taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we will now impose ashes and also come to the table. You can participate in whatever portion of that you desire. But if you are going to do both, we ask that you do the ashes first. I will be here, and you can come to me first, and I will put the ashes on you, and then you can come to the table, and we have two elders that will serve you in our usual fashion. So we will first do it, and we will serve ourselves, and then we will indicate for you to come forward.
Let us pray. Merciful God, you called us forth from the dust of the earth. You claimed us for Christ in the waters of baptism. Look upon us as we enter these 40 days bearing the mark of ashes and bless our journey through the desert of Lent to the font of rebirth. All that we do and pray is in the name of Jesus, for in his cross you proclaim your love forever and ever. Amen. Stand and sing hymn number 418. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. I charge you to go from here reflecting on how grateful we are to be in the presence of God, but also reflecting on what things may cause you to sometimes leave the presence of God. Reach out and receive forgiveness for those things and come home. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. You may now depart in silence and put your sheets in the basket as you leave.